Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service uh, from my dining room. Uh, glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. Um, Want to just give a, a quick update. Um, physically, I'm, I'm doing fairly well, just uh, some aches and pains and and uh, as you can hear, kind of a raspy voice, a um, little bit of a cough. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I uh, have to interrupt uh, for coughing this morning, but I'm sure you'll understand. I'm going to begin uh, in kind of a unique way this morning. And before you jump up and and uh, turn off your computer or uh, shut me down, just stick with me a minute. But I'm going to ask a question. It's a little unusual for uh, a Thanksgiving service. Um, how many of you would consider yourselves to be a liar? Now I know that's no way to, to start a sermon. And who would admit that anyway? <clears throat> let, me, let me rephrase that just a bit. How many of you have ever said thank you, but you didn't really mean it? Or, or you said thank you, but it was just words, not really something that was from your heart? If you're like me, when you were a child, uh, you were taught to say those words. It was a polite thing to do. And oftentimes, maybe without even thinking about why we were doing that. But I want us to think about that question this morning. What are we truly thankful for? If we were to stick with, with just an honest expression of our gratitude, what would be those things that we would truly, truly be grateful for? Uh, today we're going to examine an account of, of an event in the life of Jesus. I, I think that will help us put this concept of thankfulness into perspective. Uh, we find Jesus in Luke chapter 17. We'll go there in just a moment, Luke chapter 17. But we find Jesus um, heading to Jerusalem for his final journey. This is uh, the trip that will take him into uh, Jerusalem where he'll be tried and uh, eventually crucified and, of course, then uh, rising from the dead. Uh, and while everything that Jesus said is important and we need to pay attention to it, uh, oftentimes we, we just discuss that these final days uh, were times when he was uh, maybe a little more purposeful in helping us see those things that were uh, closest and most dear to his heart. And so uh, we pay close attention as uh, we listen in on this conversation that Jesus had um, with a group of, of individuals, a group of men. Uh, he finds himself near the territory of Samaria. And uh, Samaria, uh, obviously, is that area of land. Uh, the Samaritans were people that were half-breed, half-Jew, half-Gentile. And uh, they were hated by the Jews. And they were not accepted by the Jews. And we see Jesus all through his ministry loving them, ministering to them in a, in a variety of ways. Um, but here is a group of, of people that Jesus is encountering that actually is made up of both Jews and uh, Samaritans. And so it's a very, very unique situation. In fact, Jesus in, is encountering 10 men. Uh, I want to read this account for you. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Luke chapter 17. I'm going to begin reading at verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the, along the border between Samaria and and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God. In a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, or to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Will you pray with me? Father God, I just thank you today. Uh, for the opportunity, uh, even in this unique way, to share the truth of your gospel. And Lord, as we uh, look at your word today, I just pray for clarity. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray for the strength of my voice to, to be able to, to be heard. And uh, Lord, that the distraction would not be there, that uh, people would hear your voice uh, as I speak today. Lord, I thank you for um, your care and your love of us. 
And uh, I thank you, Father, that uh, you have allowed us this time together. I pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning, as we uh, unpack this truth about these uh, these 10 men and the encounter that Jesus had with these 10 men, um, I want us to discover that we can understand the importance of gratitude. Uh, we can understand the importance of genuine thankfulness uh, by exploring the reaction of Jesus to one who expressed his thankfulness in a genuine way. See, 10 men experienced a supernatural encounter with God. 10 men experienced something that, that most of us will never, ever be able to define because it's not been a part of our lives. And how they respond to Jesus was surprising. And so I, I believe this morning we need to investigate a little bit just to find out what it is that was going on, not only in the hearts and minds of these men, but more importantly, in the mind and heart of Christ. Uh, we need to investigate, first of all, the condition of these men. Look with me again at verse 12 that I read a moment ago. As he, being Jesus, as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. Now, we've heard this word often as we studied, study scripture. Uh, leprosy is kind of a, a general term for a variety of physical symptoms. Uh, there are a few facts that we know simply by what we read here in this verse. The fact that they had leprosy. Uh, we know a little bit about their condition in the first century. Uh, these men obviously were suffering physically. Uh, some of the symptoms that they would have experienced were uh, fatigue and sore joints. Um, obviously, blemishes would break out on the skin and, and turn into open sores. And this was always, always accompanied by a very foul, foul odor. Uh, their body is literally rotting away. Uh, parts are falling off on their own. Uh, they first begin to, to lose their fingers and their toes and uh, that would continue until finally they would lose their life. Uh, there was no treatment, nothing that could cure leprosy. In fact, there was not even any treatment for the symptoms of this disease. Uh, the disease was highly contagious, and, and as I said a moment ago, it ultimately end in death. And not only did they, they suffer the physical uh, ramifications of this disease, but they were also suffering socially. Uh, they were banished from the city. Uh, there were colonies that were established where uh, people with leprosy just spent time with each other. They couldn't interact with healthy people. Uh, these men were forced, therefore, to leave their families and their friends and, and be separated from those who could care for them when they needed that care the most. Uh, they had to wear clothing that was torn and, and covered with ash, and that was meant to identify them as being ones with this disease in case they, they would come in contact with healthy people. Uh, their faces always had to be covered. They could not show their face. And uh, some of that was due to the, the contagious uh, symptoms of this disease. And, and part of it was due just because of the unsightliness or the ugliness that would happen with this disease. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans uh, who suffered from this disease were forced to spend their lives together. These people that uh, in normal circumstances hated one another and and just could not get along uh, because of the disease, because they had no one else. Uh, they had to turn to each other and uh, put aside those prejudices that existed. Uh, if they did happen to meet those that were unaffected, uh, healthy people on the road, they had to cross to the other side of the road and, and shout at the top of their lungs, unclean, unclean. Not only were they suffering physically and, and socially, but they also suffered spiritually obvious by virtue of the uh, disease that they had. They were not welcome in the synagogue. They could not practice their worship. They could not uh, go and read the scriptures. And so they were isolated even from the word of God. And because of the ignorance of the time, uh, they were seen as being rejected by God. Uh, this wasn't just seen as, as a disease that they were unfortunate enough to, to have gotten, but people looked at them as being punished by God for something. Uh, because they had this disease. Now, you might be saying, Pastor Mike, it's really too bad for these guys, but what does that have to do with me? Well, you may never have a disease that, that totally ravages your body. All of us, at one time in our lives, were prisoners to sin that ravaged our spirits. The social separation experienced by these men pales in comparison to the separation from God that's caused by our sin. 
We talked about this last week. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Scripture tells us that Satan, the accuser, will be the one that's constantly shouting in our ear, unclean, unclean. With sin as a part of our lives, our situation is far worse from anything that these men had to experience. So this causes us to realize uh, we need to investigate the cry of these men. Look with me at verse 13. I'm going to back up a little bit into verse 12 uh, to get us a running start. It says, they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. We need to investigate the cry of these men. Look with me at how they cried. They cried in a loud voice. This reveals that their lives were in a state of desperation. They had hit rock bottom. Their situation was hopeless. There was no place to go. There was no other human being, number one, that could possibly help them because of the severity of this disease. Uh, but there was no human being that was willing to help them because of the separation that was necessary for this disease. And when they cried out in this loud voice, we, we need to see how they cried out, but also why they cried out. They said, have pity on us. The pity they were seeking involves mercy and compassion. They simply needed someone to care. As I just said, this was humanly impossible because of the, the ravages of this disease. There was no one to whom they could go. So it's interesting that when they saw Jesus, they still cried out and they still asked for pity. Why? Because they had heard of the compassion of this man. And not only that, but they, they had heard of the power of this man. For these 10 leper, this was the only place where they thought they could go and get just a little bitty, tiny glimmer of hope. In their desperation, these men believed that Jesus was the only purpose, or only purpose, person, excuse me, who would still care for them when no one else would. In their need for mercy and compassion, they made the right choice. They chose to cry out to the God of compassion. When sin makes us unclean, we may find others who will sympathize with us. Some may even try to convince us that our situation isn't all that desperate. But when all is said and done, the only one who can do anything about our condition is our Lord of compassion, Jesus. He not only is waiting to respond to our cry, but he actually urges us, he begs us to cry out to him through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Excuse me. The result of their cry then shows us that we need to investigate the cleansing of these men. Look at verse 14 with me. It says, when he saw them, he being Jesus, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus is responding to their pleading. He demonstrated genuine compassion for them at the very point of their need. He didn't simply stop at sympathy, but he gave them the opportunity to grab hold of a new life. He provided something for them that they had not known for years, and that is hope. Jesus challenged them to respond. He gave them a role to play in their redemption. They had to believe that he could make a difference. I want you to notice something with me. Jesus sent them to the priests. This was a Jewish requirement. Now, the, the reason he sent them to the priests was not for their healing. The priests weren't in, in uh, the process or, or in the, uh, the practice of healing people. Instead, what Jesus was doing was fulfilling uh, an expectation of the Jewish religion that once someone had been cured of a disease, once he had been healed, then the priest could then designate that person as now being clean and they could re-enter society. They could go back to, to a normal life. That was the role of the priest. And so when Jesus sent these men to the priests, he basically was saying to them, you need to go even in the midst of your disease and believe that when you get there, you'll be healed. See, the ramifications of them going to the priest, still having this, this disease, would have been horrendous. They needed to act on their belief. 
that Jesus could make a difference. They needed to act on their belief that Jesus could give them that hope. Jesus acted, asked them to act as though the requests were already granted. I want to say that again. Jesus asked them to act as though the request to be healed was already granted. We call this faith. Stepping forward, believing that Jesus would do what he said he would do. And the result, obviously, was that these men received the healing that they sought. As they went, they were healed. There was no lightning bolts. There was no fanfare. As part of their journey, they became whole. Jesus provided the solution to their problem. But in providing that solution, he called them to reach out and accept what he had to offer. When we become aware of our sin and the devastating effects of our sin, Jesus is there offering us healing, and he's offering us reinstatement into a relationship with God. As we reach out to him in faith, he doesn't promise huge fanfare. He doesn't promise some emotional experience. Now, there are times when those things do occur, and those are a gift from God. However, what Jesus calls us to is a simple act of faith. Jesus changes us and makes us into new creations, simply based on our faith, on our asking him to do so. The healing comes, the compassion, and the hope comes, as it did for these men. Now, this brings us to the saddest, I believe, section, uh, when we see that we need to investigate the character of these men. Look at verse 15 with me. Excuse me again, I'm sorry. Uh, when uh, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? The nine obviously focused on themselves. They went to the priest to be reinstated socially. They went to the priest to be restored to their rights as Jews. They may have believed that they deserved to be uh, to be better. They, they may have gone to Jesus just as the instrument to get them what they, they believed that they deserved anyway. Unfortunately, the nine quickly forgot where they had been. They forgot the desperation of their lives. They forgot the hopelessness in which they had found themselves just moments before because of the devastation of their lives. They forgot what it was like before they encountered Jesus. They forgot the depths of the suffering from which Christ had saved them. But to one, the Samaritan, he chose to focus on Christ. Now, we're not told what set this one apart. We're not told what made him more appreciative than the others. But we do know that he praised God, listen, in a loud voice. That's exactly the same phrase as we have when all ten were crying out to Jesus. It's the same intensity as his cry for help. He understood the miracle that had taken place in his life. And, and he came back with the same intensity as he felt in his desperation with an offering of praise and adoration and thankfulness to the one who made a difference in his life. He recognized that he had received a gift that he did not deserve. He accepted that his restoration came from a source outside of himself. Uh, I, I discovered in, in my study that there are some African cultures that have no word in their language that's equivalent to thank you. Instead, they have a phrase that's translated, I will talk about your name. I, I love that imagery. In other words, just uh, instead of flippantly throwing out a thank you, when, when someone does something kind for them, when they're given something that they don't deserve, they said, I'll let others know about this. I'll proclaim this to, to the world that this is the type of person you are to have offered me something this wonderful. I see that in the life of this man. He probably spent the rest of his life telling the story of what Jesus had done for him. 
He truly understood what it meant to be thankful. But Jesus, he, he was a bit confused. Just moments ago, there were 10 men who literally could not live without him. 10 men whose only hope could be found in this man, Jesus. Now, nine acted as if they wanted nothing to do with him. They were so caught up in, in their own lives and so caught up in what had taken place that they forgot the source of the grace that had made them well. They had gotten what they wanted, and now their intention was back on themselves. Jesus desires that we maintain our same level of desperation for him after our relationship is restored, as we had when we first sought him. See, salvation is not intended to simply be a means to escape hell. God sacrificed his one and only son so that we might have a restored relationship with him. One way of keeping our focus on Christ is to be consistently remembering where we came from, remembering that desperation of our lostness in sin, remembering what the, the consequence to that sin would ultimately be without Christ. This in turn should create in us an overwhelming heart of thankfulness. This leaves us at a place where we need to investigate the crowning of one man. Look at verse 19 with me. At the crowning of one man. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. We see here in these words of Jesus that this man and this man alone was offered something not offered to the other nine. Jesus did not remain focused on the failure of the nine, but he gave his full attention to the response of the one. The Samaritan responded to Christ's expression of love, not simply the outcome. I'm going to say that again. The Samaritan responded to Christ's expression of love, not simply what he had gained, not simply the outcome in his own life. Because of this, he had a heart change, not simply a body change. He had a, a new creation made in his spirit, not just a, a healing of his body. His thankfulness brought salvation, not simply physical healing, but a spiritual wholeness as well. See, Jesus doesn't uh, want to only be viewed as a provider of good things. Is he that? Absolutely. But he doesn't want to be viewed just simply as a provider of good things. He wants to be worshipped as a provider of salvation. That's genuine thankfulness. That's the genuine expression of gratitude that God calls us to. When we focus only on what this life can provide, our reward is short-lived. When we focus on Christ's offer of salvation, our reward is eternal no matter how difficult this life can get. If we have a growing relationship with Jesus, we have something that we can consistently and constantly be thankful for. The, the gunk of this life, of this existence, will someday be gone. But our worship of Jesus will last for eternity. When you put life in perspective, we all have a lot to be thankful for. Sometimes we simply take the blessings of this life for granted or, or somehow get the feeling we're entitled to these blessings. When that happens, I want us to remember this truth. True blessing, true thankfulness comes not from what we have, but true blessing comes from who God has made us to be through the overwhelmingly wonderful work of Jesus in bringing us salvation. I've read this list before, but I need us to focus on this this morning as we close. Scripture reminds us through the Apostle Paul that as a uh, one who's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that I am chosen. I'm adopted by God as a son. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm forgiven. I'm given an inheritance. I'm sealed by God's Holy Spirit. I'm made alive in Christ. I'm raised up with Christ. I, I love this one. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I'm going to stop there just for a moment. The Apostle Paul teaches us 
that, that we're in Ephesians that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. What's that mean? That means that right now, this very moment, irregardless of my physical condition, irregardless of, of all of the struggles around us, irregardless of, of where our nation is politically or, or where people are in their relationship with each other, none of that changes the fact that right now, this very moment, as one redeemed by the blood of Jesus, I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I am a child of God. I am seated in heavenly places. I'm brought near to God. I'm given peace. I'm invited into the holy of holies. I'm reconciled. I'm no longer a stranger. I'm a member of God's household. I'm redeemed. So my question as we close this morning, how do we express our gratitude to God? It's true that we, we need to take time to often thank him. We need to praise him for the blessings that he gives us. We need to, to be uh, recognizing those things that he does in our lives that make our lives more full and complete. But I believe overall God is most pleased with us when we express our, our gratitude to him in a life that's obedient and that seeks to, to please him in everything that we do. That, Romans says, is our spiritual act of worship. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for uh, these moments that we've had together. Father, thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy that has allowed us, Father, in these moments to worship and to give adoration to you. Lord, I just pray for the body of Christ, uh, that you would, uh, over these next days, uh, some will be gathering with family and friends, others uh, uh, may be spending time alone. Uh, but I pray whatever our situation. Uh, Father, that you would remind us of who we are in you and uh, what you have done to bring about our perfect and complete healing. Pray that in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord.